Can you tell me about uh, the very beginning of ECW? ECW was um, it was 1989, uh, like March 6th, right around my daughter's birthday. Actually, like the month before that, I went to a, I went to an independent show. This will all come full circle, but I'm going to start at the beginning. This is how ECW started, and I did. I went to an independent show. A guy named Joel Goodhart was running the, uh, running the show. He had a radio show on the local sports uh, talk station. He was the kind of promoter who would, he was bringing in, like, all the dream matches, like uh, Abdul against the Sheik and, uh, like, Jerry Lawler against Austin Idol and stuff. He ran out of money. Todd Gordon took it over. Todd Gordon took it over, he ran out of money, Paul Heyman took it over. Paul Heyman ran out of money, Vince McMahon took it over. So, at, at Joel Goodhart's, it was called Tri-State Wrestling Alliance. At Todd Gordon, it was Eastern. When Paulie got it, it went to Extreme. What, you want me to tell you more about uh, Todd Gordon? Um, Todd Gordon still, uh, uh, he was the guy that actually, like the first guy, Joel, Joel Goodhart, um, he he didn't start, like, he started the promotion, but he didn't start, like, the hardcore aspect of it. The hardcore aspect was started by, uh, was by uh, Todd Gordon, who's best, uh, one of my best friends still to this day. Talk to him all the time, which is very rare in this business. Um, you got guys that you think you're friends, you call them 30 times, they don't even call you back, and all you want to do is just say hi. And that, and that's a you, Justin, for not returning my phone calls. Um, uh, yeah, so, uh, Tom Gordon put a lot of money in this company, dropped almost a million into it, but he could be the guy that, that if people ask who really started the hardcore stuff, it was Todd Gordon, because Todd was the one that brought in, uh, or no, Joel Goodhart brought in, started with Cactus Jack and then Eddie Gilbert, and that's the famous match where um, Jack ripped his ear off when he did the, when he used to do that flip into the ropes and catch himself. His head would go over the top rope, and then he would pull the second rope so it would be landing like that, but there was all kinds of barbed wire, and Cactus got his ear ripped off and stuff like that. And then, uh, and then, uh, what, and then Goodhart ran out of money. Um, I guess he probably dropped about maybe a couple hundred thousand into the company, you know. But he wasn't, like, putting out a lot of money either. He was he had a $600 a, uh, a week radio show. By the time we came down to it with Paul, we were paying $50,000 a year to be on. Uh, uh, we never got paid by stations to for ECW to be on. We were always paying them. And then we would run all. That's why you wouldn't see a lot of commercials besides ours. I mean, you wouldn't see the Nordic Track or, or one of them other ones, but... um. But uh, that was part of the reason of the downfall. So uh, Todd Gordon brought it to hardcore. Todd needed a booker. Um, I, and I was talking to Todd. Actually, it was my idea. And I'll, and I'll tell you that to this day. That I was like, Todd, you can't run your jewelry. He's got a jewelry store down on 10th and Samson. His dad, um, his grandfather actually started. His grandfather was actually the first jeweler ever on Jewelers Row. Anybody from... Uh, from the Philadelphia area, he knows what, it's like Saks Smith Avenue, for, you know, it's like Rodeo Drive, you know what I mean, that's what it is in Philly, Jewelers Row, I said, you're going to need, you're gonna need a booker, he brings in um, uh, Eddie Gilbert, Eddie Gilbert turned it into the Eddie Gilbert show, kind of like with Rob Black here, it's like 20 minutes Eddie Gilbert, 20 minutes of commercials, 20 minutes of wrestling, um, uh, and then Eddie Gilbert, um, and then Eddie Gilbert brought in Paul Heyman. I remember the first time Paul Heyman came in, he asked me to go uh, hand out tickets at, the, at, we were at Eastern College. And I didn't know Paul, just met him, he asked me and the Rock and Rebel because he knew we were from the area. At Eastern College, now people remind you that Eastern College is when Todd Gordon just got us our TV deal on channel, I think it was, w, it was probably WGBS in Philly. Mm. No, it was local sports channel. I think that's what it was. Well, whatever. But that's where Terry Funk did his first announcement at this Eastern College. And then Paulie just asked me, that was just a, that's a stupid story anyway. I got much better ones about Paul. So, about a month later, I guess we're talking into, 
We might be into 93, 94 by now. A month later, all of a sudden, Paul, uh, Paul Heyman's the booker, and Eddie Gilbert's out. Paul takes over the book. Paul then really took it to the extreme. Paul was... He was he wouldn't let the wrestlers uh, uh, curse. He would always bleep out the curse. But if the audience is yelling "f you, f you, f you," he would let that play as the as the um, as the guy was cutting the promo. If Shane was in the ring cutting an interview, and the audience was cursing. Paul would cut that out. You know what I mean? Paul was always pushing the envelope. What can I do on TV next? What what can I do to shock him more? And you know, it, probably in his prime, I don't think there was a smarter man ever in this business than Paul Heyman at a point. I thought he kind of lost it at the end of ECW the last two years, but, but, um, but, uh, Paul, um, Paul's an absolute genius. If Todd Gordon would have stayed, uh, here, here's another, here's, this is how the story goes. Paul, Todd Gordon ran out of money. Paul became his partner. So, now, Joel, Ger Joel, Joel Goodhart had an original TWA. Todd Gordon invested twenty thousand into that TWA. The TWA with Joe with uh, Joel Goodhart goes under, but Todd Gordon keeps all the belts for the money that he spent. Todd starts his own company. Next thing you know, we're running TV out of Eastern College. Uh, Eddie Gilbert's the booker. Terry Funk's doing play by play, and then uh, so things are starting to take off a little bit for us. You know what I mean? We're starting to do something. We got a weekly TV show. Uh, Paulie gets the reins, and Paulie just starts going nuts, giving everybody unbelievable angles from all the way from Raven and, and Dreamer to me and Raven to Cactus Sabu to, to Malenko Guerrero to uh, Juventus. Um, I'm on a roll too. To Juventus uh, psychosis matches. Paul was the one that introduced all those things. How many? Think about how many guys Paul took that have been wrestling for ten years. But had never been on a national like rest like a, a decent wrestling scene. Never made WWF. Never made WCW. Guys like Benoit was Benoit was over doing Japan, making his money. Wasn't over at the states at all. Eddie Guerrero, Conan, Psychosis, Rey Mysterio Jr., um, uh, Juventud Guerrera. Uh, who else? Um, Shane Douglas to a point. Uh, Dean Malenko. Uh, Perry Saturn. These were guys that were working in other countries. Uh, uh, Furness and Lafon. They were they were they were workers in other countries, but they never got over in the United States. Paul Heyman figured out how to get those guys over, make the characters believable, and we had the best show on television probably for a two three year run. But we weren't national, so we couldn't pull the ratings that uh, Vince pulled. All right, I think I covered that whole question. Yeah. Um. What was it like wearing the belt five times, and what did it mean to you? All right. Uh, the belt, the only time I won the belt, and I was planned to win the belt, was the first time. Todd Gordon was, uh, I remember, Todd Gordon took over for Joe Goodhart. Todd had the organization for about three months. He wanted to put the belt on me. Don Morocco had the strap, so down at, uh, down, uh, at 42nd and Market or Walnut in Philly, um, uh, Don Morocco loses the belt to me. My, my wife helps win by throwing powder in Morocco's face, which the powder didn't fly at all because, now, if you try this at home, if you get baby powder and you throw it, you try and throw it, it has no weight to it. So if you're going to do the baby powder spot where somebody throws it in the ring, you got to make it half salt, half sugar, half baby powder so it gives its weight. So my wife's standing two feet away from Morocco, if Morocco's got me up for the tombstone pile driver. This is how I win my first magnificent belt. He's got me up for the tombstone pile driver. Follow me up here. So, this, these, these are the ropes right here. This is Don Morocco. I'm upside down. My wife's standing right here. She throws the, the uh, powder in his face, and the powder just like dissipates because it didn't have any weight to it. So, Don Morocco, he didn't care. He just went back with it, cover one, two, three. That was my first title. Uh, it kind of when I was a kid, I told I probably told you people that I I, I lived my life stream wrestling, and I'm very fortunate to do that. When I was a kid, I never had to be champion. All I cared about was being a pro wrestler. So it wasn't like it wasn't like the 
it wasn't like winning the World Series to me uh, for wrestling. You know what I mean? Like, like if you were a kid and grew up and you wanted to pitch in the World Series and you did the seventh grade and you won. You know what I mean? Because it's a work. Wrestling's a work. The reason you get the belt is because whoever's writing it um, wants you to have the belt. You know what I mean? And uh, so it wasn't that big of a deal, but it was. It, it was a little bit big of a deal in the sense that you are somebody now. ECW is the third largest organization in uh, in the United States. Uh, we're covering in all the magazines. They have our top ten. You know what I mean? So it's like getting respect in the business, saying, you know what, you have made it. Even though there's tons of guys that have gotten belts that haven't deserved it, and the only good reason they got it because they were the Booker's friend. You know what I mean? Uh, so uh, the next time I get the belt was um, somebody got hurt. Well, I got it once. I won it off of Don Morocco, then I got it because we took the belt off me, gave it to Mikey, just so Mikey could lose it to Steve Austin. This is right before Austin turned into Stone Cold. I was the last one to wrestle him before he had his first match at WWF. At Stone, uh, I didn't even know if he was Stone Cold. He was the ringmaster, I think, then. But uh, I, I wrestled him bald. He came in. I wrestled him like three weeks in a row. The first week, he, the first two weeks he had hair. The third week he was bald. So the last match he was bald for. Uh, great guy to work with. I mean, Steve was such a good guy. Um, so uh, Steve, meanwhile, while while the boss wants wants me to lose the belt, but he doesn't want me to lose it to Austin because he thinks that might hurt me as a champion. When I didn't really agree with it, so he figures put the belt on Mikey Whipwreck and he could be our intermediate champion. So Austin will beat him the next week. Well, lo and behold, while Mikey's got the belt, we still got 14 days to our next show. Steve Austin signs a contract with WWF. What do you do? You have a three-way. It was supposed to be Mikey against Austin for the for the title. They couldn't do that because everybody knew Austin was leaving, so they made it a three-way match with me, Mikey, and Austin, and I had to win the belt back because you couldn't keep the third largest organization's belt on a small guy like Mikey Whipwreck. Remember, he, they, they use him, they call him a transitional champion. So I got lucky there. Uh, that's the reason I got that belt back. I got the belt back a third time, not necessarily in each order. Uh, the third time I had to drop Raven off in rehab, uh, me and him were wrestling. He came over to my house at uh, like Tuesday afternoon, and we were wrestling at the Philadelphia Arena. It was me and him for the belt. And he goes, "Heck, I gotta go on a road trip, man." He goes, "I gotta get out of here." And Scotty was having a drug problem, which, believe me, it happens in this business. When you go on the road 22 days a month, you're living out of airports. It's easy to take one pill to get up, one pill to go to sleep, one pill to get up. Uh, this business will, will will turn a lot of people towards drugs. Um, to me, it just turned towards alcohol. So, Raven, I dropped off at rehab, and then I had to go win the belt from his flunky, who was Stevie Richards. So, I beat Stevie Richards. So, that was the fourth time I had the belt. Three times because there was a fluke. And now, the other time, is, give me a second. Oh, the other time I won the belt was when Shane Douglas didn't want to lose to me. So, Nancy turned on Shane and went with me during a match, and Nancy screwed him by hitting him in the back of the leg with the, uh, with the thing because he was leaving to go to the WWF. So every time I got the belt except the first time was by accident or because either somebody went to rehab, somebody got hurt, or somebody was leaving for the WWF. I, I don't need a belt. I got a cane. I got a cigarette. I got a beer. I don't need any props. There's... Some wrestlers need belts, some wrestlers don't. The Sandman does not need a belt. I can lose every night of the week and still get over more than the guy that just beat me. What was it like working with Steve uh, Austin? Uh, I touched on it a little bit earlier. Uh, I got to work three matches with him. And, um, and to me, I, I had a lot of respect for Steve Austin because... Uh, I had seen him a lot on TV, and I just thought he was a great ring technician, and uh, I just had a lot of respect for the guy, and and as it turns out, like a lot of people tell me now, after they meet me, they're like, damn, you're just a regular guy, hack, and I, and that's what I can say about Steve, he was just a regular guy, and then even when I, see, when, when I seen him later um, uh, in WWF, um, he probably, he was just really super strong, Stone Cold 316, and... Um, 
and uh, he treated me like I was a, like like I was an old friend of his. So uh, he's one of the guys that's that's done me good in this business. And a lot of people think, oh, don't you think he stole your gimmick? Your gimmick is. Uh, by beer, so he drinks beer. He doesn't come out and slam beer cans against his head. He doesn't drink a six pack before he goes into the ring. Somebody throws him a beer afterwards. No, I don't think Stone Cold stole my gimmick, and no, I am not mad at him. Good night. All right, boys, that's enough for tonight, right? Or did you have another question? Oh, there's still more. I thought that was the last one. I got two more, and then I want to ask you: What was it like getting naked in Pensacola, Florida? Pensacola, Florida, to tell you the truth, I don't remember much. Me, Fonzie, Just Incredible, and maybe Spike Dudley. We started in Tom Landry. He's got a place in Clearwater, too, uh, right by, by my, my house in Clearwater. Um, we started doing oyster shooters at like 1 o'clock in the afternoon. I had a half gallon of vodka on me. Here, let me see where. Oh, oh my vodka's not here. I drank about three-quarters of a half gallon of vodka, did about ten oyster shooters, don't even remember much about in the ring, but I got totally naked. There was 3,000 people there. What was it like? my parent have. What was it like? I don't remember because I was drunk. I don't remember what it was like. And I'd never seen a video of it because Paul made sure the video got destroyed. So I haven't seen a video of it, but it kind of... I'm a real hard person to embarrass, but my parents did call me about it. Because they live in Pensacola, Florida, and they read in a mat, and they read in like some little rag paper that I got naked in Pensacola. So I told them it was a publicity stunt. What was it like uh, working with the walking living legend Terry Funk? Ter oh God, we were just talking about Terry the other day. Um, the guy for just he's done so much for this business. The guy's literally blood swore. Was my my I don't have my shirt on. Blood, sweat, and tears, man. Terry Funk's the guy that's gave it, that that's gave gave it to you, and and he knew. Um, I'm almost done, Devin. And he, and Terry Funk was, he was just the he was just the kind of guy that would give himself. He's not the kind of guy that would run up to you after your match and say, "Oh, kid, you did this wrong. You did this wrong." But if you went to pick his brain or asked him for advice or. Whenever Terry was around and there was a monitor, if Terry was watching the monitor, I was sitting my ass right next to him. Guys like Terry Funk, guys like Rick Rude, guys that, uh, guys like Kevin Sullivan, guys like Raven, guys like Kevin Nash. You know what I mean? Guys that really get this business and know in and out. And nobody knows it better than Terry Funk. The guy's literally a walking god to me. Um. I have like two more. Go ahead, come on. Um, when you were in WCW and your name became Hack, can you explain how that happened? Who named you? Yeah, the first night I was in there, see, Paul E, before I had left Paul, I left Paul uh, September 8th, but in June he tried to patent the Sandman name on me, so. See, so, but he couldn't screw me with it because I had to prove, so his lawyers, I had to pay his lawyers a thousand dollars to take their name off the patent and give the patent to me, but I had to call Bill after a friend of mine who, uh, who's an editor of a lot of magazines, pretty much every magazine you see in the United States, except WOW, uh, or no, does that have to do well? Or not after Napolitano. I had to actually produce five magazines of me being the Sandman previously to 1997 or whatever so to get Paul off my case. So I'm in line to get the Sandman name. So I walk into the big war room in WCW and I got some of the lawyers, so, you know, the Dusty Roses, the Kevin Sullivans, the Mike Grahams, the J.J. Dillons, maybe Hogan, maybe Nash, maybe uh, Bischoff. Um, she goes, nope, can't use the Sandman. So I'm standing there. I mean, everybody's there. Dusty's there holding barbed wire, which I'll tell you in a minute. Everybody's there. They're like, well, what should we do? And I'm like, well, why don't we just call me? You guys are going to, I said, listen, you guys got me for a three-minute promo at 9 o'clock. I said, let me just go out there and call out Bam Bam Bigelow, and you guys don't know who I am. Make it like I'm taking over your, like, take it over your show. You don't know who the, you, who the hell I am. So that's what they did for the first week. The second week, I'm in there playing chess. Uh, me and Raven are playing chess, and Nash comes up to me because Nash, Nash has the book. Nash is making all decisions. Nash pulls me out in the hallway, and I'm like, oh, sh well, you know, what, did I do something wrong? You know, because Nash was the man. And uh, Nash, he sits down, he's like, 
He's like, Sam, man, what are we going to do with your name? What are we going to call you? I said, how about Hack? My, I've had that name since uh, I was five years old. He goes, great, hardcore Hack, I love it. He called uh, Diane Myers or whatever, the lawyer or one of the girls over there, said, print it up as, uh, he's Hack. Um, one time when you were in WCW, I think you went out on the ladder, sat down, opened up a beer, smoked a cigarette, and then... No, I never opened up a beer on WCW. Was there ever a time when... There was a time I smoked cigarettes. This is a good story. A guy who was the biggest prick. What was the, uh... Devin, what was the head security guy's name? Doug Dillinger. Doug Dillinger. Biggest... My first day in Minnesota. I get a call Sunday night. J.J. Dillon tells me to be in Minnesota the next day. You know, and this is my first shot at a real big company, you know, so this is a big day for me. I fly into town, get to rent a car, go to the ring myself. You know I mean? I've been done the ECW thing, but WCW was a much larger scale. I remember, they're, they're right in the ratings war with WWF. They're going to have literally three, four million people watching you on TV, so... And Devin will tell you, it's, you, you kind of feel it, you know what I mean? Not that you feel the pressure, but it's a big day in your life when you're taking a jet to a night. You get a call the night before, it's like... It's like, you ever, like, wanted to be that rich guy when you were a kid who, like, jet sets around the world and stuff like that, you know? It's like, you get a call Sunday night, 8 o'clock, says there's a ticket waiting for you. If you're on a plane at 6 a.m. to go to Minnesota, and you go there, and you don't know if, I don't, I didn't know what was going to happen, but if you're pulling a four, I was, my, my first time I was ever on their show, they put me in the hardest spot, there, there was two hard spots, TV goes by 15-minute segments. So if a show's two hours long, they break it down into 15-minute segments what the ratings are. So WCW was getting killed by WWF from 9 o'clock to 9.15 and then 10.45 to 11 when the main event was on. Everybody always tuned to Vince. One from 9 to 9.15, Vince was setting up his whole show back then. Cactus was in the ring, Vince was up on the stage or something, and they would set up all their angles for the whole show that night. So they were getting killed in that rating, so I guess that's why I got stuck, that's why I got there. But um, I held my own out of the eight, eight out of my first ten times that I was on Nitro, I never had lower than the third highest rated segment. And I got Nash to thank for that. I mean, I got Bigelow to thank for that because he was working with me. I got Raven to thank for that because he was a lot of the work with me. I got Knobs to thank for that. But Nash had a lot to do with it because... I would have been some other totally different character if Nash didn't get the book and just say, come on, just come in and be the same man and, and kick ass like you do, you know what I mean? Oh, then the, oh so the other story, Doug Dillinger. Um, um, uh, Eric Bischoff comes up to me, he goes, Hack, he goes, I want to do something with you tonight, but I'm not sure exactly what I want to do. I, you, you were there then, probably. He goes, but I don't know what to do. Do you got any ideas? But, and, and he said something about the cigarette. So me, of course, I don't want to say something stupid right off the top of my head. I'm like, you know what? Let me go get Chastity. Chastity was the girl. So I said to him, I said, I said, listen, Eric, could you give me a minute? I don't like to really go over anything without my manager being here. And he understood that totally. You know, he's like, he's that's cool. Get back to me. So I go grab him. And I go grab him, and I got a, and I got a, I got a great idea about um, uh. Um, about so instead of just me and Bischoff doing the angle, I got Doug Dillinger involved, I got JJ Dillon involved, and then it went up to Bischoff. So I grab Eric, I said, Eric, I got something. He pulls me into the side room, just me, him, and Chastity. I laid the whole thing out. He goes to one of his funkies, he goes, Go get Doug Dillinger, go get JJ Dillon, go get all the security guys. Ten minutes later, everybody piles into this room. Eric looks at me and goes, All right, hack, give it to him. So right there, I saw the look on Doug Dillinger's face. He was like, and then he never gave me a hassle about it. It was like, it was like no problem after that. You know what I mean? Once he realized that I had the boss's respect, that that if that boss is going to go to me, listen, heck, all right, you're going to produce this 15-minute segment tonight for six million people. You know what I mean? That that was the only way to get the guy's respect. Because it, the, I, the, do you ever seen anybody else get the guy's respect? Yeah, uh, go, go to, go point, look at him, that's, tell him who you are, man. You know it, Evan Courageous. Evan, he's my buddy, he was in WCW with me. Yeah, Alright, we Evan. done with questioning for the night? Enough of a lesson? Alright, good. <laughs>